Hi, this is Nisha, and you're getting a voiceover for this video because actually I sold my rifle a couple of years ago, but I think the story, especially the designer, Melvin Johnson, really needs to be called out in history. A lot of people talk about John Grand, and, and rightfully so, as do with uh, John Moses Browning, even foreign designers like Dudnesev in Belgium. But we don't really know much, we don't really talk much about Melvin Johnson, and for good reason. He didn't, uh, he did not design a whole lot. But the story of his 1941 Johnson automatic rifle is extraordinary. And I'm going to give kind of the Cliff Notes version in this video, otherwise we're going to be here for an hour. And neither of us wants that, do we? Well, Melvin Johnson was a member, a member of the Marine Corps. He was in the reserves by the 1930s at the rank of captain. He was also a young lawyer and apparently a part-time gun designer. 1935, thereabouts, he had this idea of a uh, short recoil operating system for a full-size military rifle. And the idea behind this, it would not have a gas system to get fouled up and it would not have the long op rod of many rifles such as the M1 Garand. By 1936, he had a couple of very crude, very primitive prototypes made it essentially a local machine shop, not even a gun manufacturer. But they proved the efficacy of his short recoil system that it could that it could work. The following year, 37, they actually looked at his prototypes at Quantico. The Army did. Now keep in mind, by this point, the M1 Grand had been in development for a decade and actually had been adopted the year before. So the M1 Grand in 30-06 is America's new rifle. Still, Quantico takes a look at Johnson's design. At this time, his gun is using BAR mags. So, following on from this, Johnson negotiates with the firearms manufacturer Marlin to make three more prototypes still using the BAR mag. And again, one of these would go to Aberdeen, but would fail. Now, here's the thing. Johnson says that it failed because of the mags used and the ammo used, because the mags and ammo were not only provided by the U.S. Army, they were loaded by the U.S. Army. So kind of the same story we hear a couple of decades later with the AR-10 AR-15. They really weren't interested, but they were kind of humoring him. And so what, what happened? Johnson was not happy. He thought the magazine was the failure point. And so he designed the 10-round rotating magazine we're more familiar with in the Johnson. It's kind of inspired by that of the Craig Jorgensen, the U.S. military's uh, Craig there. And this was good because the Army especially wanted something soldiers could fire prone with. And if you had a mag hanging out the bottom, that was not happening. So it was good to have a mag that set flush. Also, the rotating mag allowed it to be topped off using... 1903 stripper clips, five round clips, or if you shot, say, seven rounds out of a 10 round mag, you could go ahead and refill it using single rounds because of the, how the system worked. Best of all, Johnson's design kind of had a pinned in magazine. So if later a customer wanted a box magazine or something else, you could just remove the magwell or magazine unit and put in a different type of magwell or feeding device. Likewise, his rifle 
had a quick detaching barrel. It had a latch on the underside. So you just could pull the barrel out. It was a somewhat long rifle, just under 46 inches compared to the M1 Grand, which is a bit under 44 inches, so a couple inches longer than the Grand. Honestly, it weighed about the same as the Grand, at about 9.5 pounds. Although the Grand had a 24-inch barrel, the Johnson rifle had a 22-inch. Now, this is something that people often forget. You know, time goes by. Today we think of the Grand as this remarkable piece of American heritage that everyone loves. It's, you know, good old-fashioned uh, baseball and apple pie. But back in 1939, 1940, it was actually incredibly controversial. And with some good reason. The original Grand did not use the gas piston system we know today. It used a gas trap system the bang system, which was known for easily fouling and just being very ammo sensitive. Johnson's rifle, on the other hand, really couldn't foul up because it had no gas system. Likewise, because of the short recoil system where the barrel was on a spring, it was not ammo sensitive at all. So there was a lot of back and forth even in Washington, D.C., in the public and the press, not to mention, of course, in the military about the Grand. You had some people on the pro-Grand camp and you had other people who were dead set against it. Some of them thought the 1903, the bolt action, was perfectly fine. Others kind of started lauding Johnson's gun just as a way to point it to an alternative to the Grand. There is a... Um, there's a pretty famous article in American Rifleman from this period, written by Mr. Ness, that greatly favors the Grand, excuse me, the uh, Johnson over the Grand. But to be fair, Ness was a big opponent of the Grand, so he was probably not an unbiased source. Nevertheless, by 1940, Aberdeen tested the updated version of the Johnson rifle with the new. Uh, rotating magazine or you know vertical magazine there and uh, generally found it to be quite good it had quite a few uh, rounds put through it I think around 4,000 and had fewer than 50 stoppages of note they did have some concerns but you know there were things like they didn't like the handguard they weren't sure the trigger group was up to snuff they didn't like the safety they didn't like that you couldn't mount a standard bayonet this is because of the short stroke with the barrel recoiling back and forth. You could not have the weight of a standard, you know, 1903 type bayonet, 1905 to be exact, on there. It would throw off the balance. So what Johnson developed was kind of a lightweight spike bayonet. Kind of think about something not too dissimilar to what we see on the infield number four, but I digress. So that was some complaints. They admitted that it had made improvements, that it was a good design, but they said again, look, the Army's not interested, we've got the Grand, please stop asking us. Yet, the debate continued into 1940. Now, interestingly, Johnson wasn't really aiming to dethrone the Grand. He just wanted to have a substitute standard. I think he just wanted to do his bit. I think he just thought it might be interesting to design a gun. Now, since he was a Marine, he was maybe hopeful the Marines would adopt it. At this point, while the Army had adopted the Grand, the Marines were, were holding out. They had not adopted it yet. They were still issuing the 1903 as their standard gun. So there was still some hope there that the small Marine Corps might adopt it. It, it just really goes on and on. It gets into the press. Congress gets involved. I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting kind of pre-prescience <laughs> for what comes later with a night, you know, M16. And then in May after, in May of 1940, after the Congress just put a lot of pressure, they put the Grand and the Johnson up against each other. What's funny is. There was only one Johnson prototype 
that was well used at this point at these trials, but there were four brand new Garands. And yet, there was a lot of spectators there, and everyone concluded that the, uh, that the Johnson was holding its own quite well with the Grand. But the thing is, the Grand was already well established, as I keep repeating. My point is it never had a chance, no matter how well it showed itself and how quickly it was developing. Keep in mind, we're at 1940, still in the first half of the year. Johnson has working prototypes, and he just came up with the design in his head in 1935. So, not bad at all. <laughs> so, it was just a thing, but they, they kept testing it, they kept trying it back and forth, and in the end, the military just, they, they weren't biting. The U.S. military just wasn't going for the Johnson, no matter how much potential it might have. Keep in mind, we're still at peacetime at this point, too. However, there was a bit of salvation for uh, Melvin Johnson, because in August of that year, the, uh, the, the government of the ne Netherlands in exile, the Dutch government, ordered over 10,000 Johnson rifles from Mr. Johnson. Notice I'm not using model names yet. This is kind of where that comes in. <laughs> What's funny, Johnson has a contract, and the rifle officially becomes adopted as the 1941, model 1941, by the Dutch. One problem, he doesn't have a factory. He has no way to make these guns. So he actually he finds an abandoned factory in Cranston and essentially builds it from the ground up in 1940, having to beg, borrow, and almost steal, I mean, he's a lawyer at least, uh, machinery, materiel, everything. And keep in mind, he has no manufacturing experience whatsoever. This is a whole new venture for him. And somehow he manages to get a factory up and running in less than a year under, okay, not wartime conditions yet, but getting really close to World War II. And, of course, Britain and, and all that, there's war in Europe. So everyone knows it's coming, so resources are getting quite tight. While the army was no really going to play with the Johnson anymore, yeah, his Johnson wouldn't get played with. The Marines were happy to play with his Johnson. And so in November of that year, they tested again against the Grand. Really run it through the muck and mud. And what would happen, it would hold quite well. The Johnson would prove itself... In an endurance test, it would go through sand, dirt, mud, all that stuff. But the Grand just barely beat it out. Again, as I keep repeating, and it's just important, the Grand was a tested design. And, and by 1940, nearly 1941, the Grand is into several revisions as, and in production, whereas he's still working with his prototypes, and he's still getting his factory up. So the Marines looked at them, they said, ah, the Grand's a smidgen better, but you know what, we're not going to adopt either, we're still happy with our 1903. What happens next? Johnson gets the factory up and running in early spring of 1941, starts to deliver guns, on the Dutch contract, but then the Japanese overrun all of the Dutch colonies in East Asia. So only the first tiny shipment gets out. Most of the guns just sit there on the docks over in San Francisco. 1941 goes on. Everyone knows what happens. They, uh, <laughs> you know, war, war happens. How the Marines ended up well, Johnson had loaned two dozen 1941-type rifles 
to the Marines for testing in uh, jump operations, uh, the para units. So the paras and the Marine Raiders tried them out, along with the 1941 Johnson light rifle, or the light machine gun. They, do, they did actually adopt the 1941 LMG, the Marines did, in limited numbers. It's kind of a substitute standard. They never officially adopted the 1941 self-loading rifle, but they had a couple of dozen, and since they were just sitting there on the docks and then Pearl Harbor happened, long story short, the Marines essentially helped themselves to the rifles. They just they took what they needed. And best estimates are they grabbed about 750. So let's say, being generous, the Marines had about 800 Johnson rifles. And uh, they would use these. I mean, the Marines needed guns. They would use them on Guadalcanal early on. At least 100 were there. They were also used on Bougainville and the Solomons. In still limited numbers, 1903s are still common. Grands are coming into use. And of course, 1942, the Marine Corps had to adopt something. And so they did adopt the M1 Grand standard issue that year. So you'll see quite a few Johnsons in use in the Pacific early on, 1942, getting into 43. But then they start to be phased out in favor of the Grand. With fewer than in a thousand in service and no real source for spare parts, logistically, the Grand made more sense. And soon there were many more Grands available. Most of the Johnsons were uh, pulled out of service one way or the other, or just lost or destroyed, frankly, in 1943 and in the 1944. By 44, really, the Grand had totally replaced it. Almost. <laughs> a few were spotted in 1945, around March, during the invasion and uh, capture of Iwo Jima. So a few Marines did manage to hang on to them. I suspect they were probably the Raiders. They, they were tenacious like that. The paratroopers had actually been disbanded a short time earlier. And that's pretty much the story of the U.S. Marines' use of the Johnson. They were about the only branch to issue it in any numbers whatsoever. The, uh, the, the Dutch government, the Netherlands, surprisingly, would actually end up getting most of the guns they ordered, except for a few that were lost by the Marines. Many of the Marine guns were returned to the Johnson Automatic Rifle Factory at Cranston. And they would ultimately deliver over 16,000 rifles to the Dutch, who would use them over in East Asia, the islands, throughout the 1940s and, and, uh, and 50s. In 1946, after the end of World War II, the Johnson Rifle Factory would buy back about 100 1941 rifles from the Marines. Well, I guess buy back's not the right word since they never bought them. Uh, you know, gain back because they were kind of uh, Lynn lease guns. You know what I mean. And they would refurbish these and then sell them on the civilian market in 1947, 1948. Unfortunately, the factory closed in 1949. So it was in business less than a decade. The Dutch, in turn, would uh, retire their 1941s in the 1950s because, again, lack of spare parts and just modern advancements in small arms. That's mostly where the story ends. A company named Winfield would import a large number, over 15,000, 1941 Johnsons from the Netherlands in the 1950s and sell them on the civilian market. Some were sold as military condition guns. Again, they were usually reparkerized and had their wood refinished or replaced. Others were turned into sporters, where they were given a blued finish and, you know, uh, fancy pants stocks and, and all that good stuff. 
they even did some different barrel lengths. The only other nation to really use the Johnson was Chile, who purchased around a thousand chambered for seven millimeter Mauser, seven by 57. So this is why you can occasionally find Johnson barrels in that chambering. It's also been said that Israel got their hands on some of the 1941 rifles. They definitely had some of the 1941 light machine guns in the 50s, but then again, Israel had just about everything at that point before they standardized. So Winfield would have the majority of the Johnsons. We don't know exactly how many were made. Estimates range from 21,000 up to as high as 26,000. Here's how the serial numbers worked. They would do just a no prefix block up to 10,000. Then they would add an A going again up to 10,000. Then they would add a B prefix. We know that production ended in the B prefix, but we don't know how deep into it. Some claim to have guns, you know, B, 5,000, yada, yada. The highest I was able to personally confirm was around B2000 and some change. So I tend to say there was around 22,000 some odd 1941 Johnsons made. But that's just a guesstimate based on observed serials. Again, there are reports of higher number serials, but here's the thing. Serial numbers didn't always match on Johnson rifles. You have to kind of look at the serial on the receiver. Other parts may or may not have the same number. So some people might have seen you know, 5,000 B serial on a different component, but it, the serial, the receiver might have said 1,000 B. You, you just, it, you don't know. So, you know, not a large number. Ironically, about as many as the Armalat AR-180 were ever produced years later. And I mentioned Armalat because after the, uh, the Johnson Automatic Factory closed, uh, Melvin Johnson himself went to work for Armalite. Actually, he predates Eugene Stoner there by a couple of years. And if you look at the 1941 Armalite rifle, it uses a eight lug rotating bolt, very similar to what appeared in the AR-10 in 1955, 1956, and also, of course, what was scaled down and carried over to the AR-15 in 1957, 58. So while Stoner is given a lot of credit for the AR, Melvin Johnson essentially developed the bolt and, of course, by extension, the barrel extension it used. Kind of interesting, I, I, I think. Unfortunately, Melvin Johnson passed away very prematurely in 1965 at the age of 55. Did I not mention that at the beginning? When he started all of this in 1935, he was 25 years old. He designed a firearm, managed to get it tested by the U.S. Army and Marines multiple times, managed to get attention in the press, managed to work with Marlin, managed to get a very working gun ready to go in three to four years and really threatened the M1 Grand at a time when he wasn't even aiming to do it. On top of that, he managed to open a factory right before World War II with no business experience. He hired employees, trained them, got them to work, got machines for them to work on, and somehow managed to find resources to produce guns in 1941-1942. A lot of times he kind of had to, you know, make do, but yet his guns are not known for being substandard, not at all. The quality is, is quite remarkably high, considering all the obstacles in his way. So it's actually very remarkable he made 22000 at all, and that his gun actually saw combat before the M1 Grand did in the hands of the Marines in 1942, and worked damn well. Even that light spike bayonet the U.S. Uh, Army was so concerned over. <laughs> it's just a really neat story. Now, I will, you know, conclude. I said this in the grand video. It's, it's common knowledge. 
as I said, the M1 Grand used the gas trap system, the bang system originally. One thing that also kind of helped it improve itself and, and really get ahead of the Johnson was they went to the, uh, the, the stroke system, the piston system we know today with drilling a gas port in the barrel, which increased reliability and also decreased the need for cleaning. So that really helped the Garand. But unfortunately, this uh, young, obviously very talented, and I would imagine very charismatic to have as much success as he did, uh, individual, really succeeded and made something truly interesting, unique, and reliable. And at the same time, this is the true American success story. I mean, this, this is the kind of story that Americans love to hear, you know, kind of rags to riches, you know, something out of nothing. I'm not going to say Johnson retired a, a wealthy man or passed away and was wealthy, but he made connections and he earned much respect in the firearms community. I mean, otherwise he wouldn't have been hired by Armalite, for example. So that's why I really felt this video needed to be done, even if my gun is gone now. But I hope you enjoyed it. Sorry it was a slideshow, but I did my best. You did see some pictures of my old gun, and we put up some others too, so we do have other videos on other military guns, such as the Rising used by the Marines, not to mention handguns and the Grand and plenty of other things. So if you liked the video and had patience, appreciate it. Please like, share, subscribe, and also if you'd like to help support the channel, check out the link to our Patreon page. Really appreciate you tuning in, and I'll, we'll be back with a live video very soon. This is Misha, and we'll catch you there.